So when um, when Rojan when Rojan asked me to do this a year ago, I had no idea that I would be talking about what I just talked about. So uh, like I said, a lot of this is a surprise to me, and it's, it's again I'm very honored to to be here. But what I'm going to talk about is emergency head and neck radiology. What you need to know at night. So how many people in the audience love head and neck radiology? Right. Oh look at this. <laughs> the table. The table in the back. Did Kazaruni raise her hand or not? I, I think I'll. You know, I read Dwayne Mes. <laughs> You know, I read Dwayne Mezwa's papers when I was a resident, too, so uh, thanks, Dwayne, for teaching me about GI radiology. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, hopefully, in the next 40 minutes or so, is talk a little bit about neck infections and a little bit about vascular emergencies. So we'll talk a little bit about neck infections. And, you know, I think we all see this. And, and you know, I think one thing that we can all attest to is that we can have something wrong with ourselves, but if you have a child, what's the worst thing you want? You want something, you don't want anything wrong with them, right? So, you know, here's a little buckaroo, and you can see that there's an infection involved in the left orbit. So this is sort of a typical thing that can come in in the middle of the night. And the thing that we always have to remember about orbital, periorbital infections such as this is the following is that the majority of the infections that involve, can you see my point or not? You can't, the, yes and no, okay. Um, the, it'll get better, I think, as the sun sets, right? So the, the majority of the infections that involve the orbit are primarily arise from the paranasal sinuses. And as you'll see here, that's a very big dis differentiating feature because that initially is going to cause an initial triage. So, for example, this is a patient that has a preceptal cellulitis. So you always have to ask that famous question, what is a preceptal cellulitis? Now, everyone's heard of se the septum, right? Now, does anybody know what the septum is or where it attaches to? Because the question is, if you say it's preceptal cellulitis versus postceptal cellulitis, it makes a tremendous difference of how these patients are treated. But if you don't understand that little differentiating feature, then you're not going to be able to be accurate in your diagnosis. So on your left here is an example, again, of preceptal cellulitis. So where is the orbital septum? Well, the orbital septum is as follows. This is where the lacrimal sac is. And there's a little area here which is called the anterior lacrimal crest, and there's an area here that's called the posterior lacrimal crest. The orbital septum attaches to the posterior lacrimal crest. So if you have an inflammatory process and the abnormality is anterior to the posterior lacrimal crest, that means that this is a preceptal process. And the other thing about preceptal cellulitis, and this one is a good example here, is that notice how the paranasal sinuses are completely aerated. So what I'm saying is that the etiology of preceptal cellulitis tends to be different from postceptal cellulitis, and the most common etiology of preceptal cellulitis is a bug bite or impetigo, and these patients usually go home and they're treated with some type of oral antibiotics. <clears throat> this, on the other hand, is a patient with postceptal cellulitis. Now, how do we know it's postceptal? Well, now we're all experts, right? So this is what, and that's the lacrimal sac. This is the anterior lacrimal crest. Here's the posterior lacrimal crest. And now we can see this abnormality extending deep to the posterior lacrimal crest. So now we can make the, now we can make the diagnosis that this is postseptal cellulitis. So now you have to ask my second favorite question. So what? Who cares? You know, why do, why do we have head and neck radiologists, right? You know, why in the world? And the reason is, and even my wife, who's a very proud pediatrician, would have to admit that we as radiologists make a difference. Because if we say that the patient has a postseptal cellulitis, as is seen here, in the majority of instances, these patients are admitted, and at the very least, they're treated with IV antibiotics, because it's very rare for a patient to be sent home with postseptal cellulitis. The next step of the progression is we talked about preceptal, then we talked about postseptal. The next step is what indeed if you develop an abscess, and this is a subperiosteal abscess. So the majority of times, if a patient has a subperiosteal abscess with this mass effect, these patients will go to the operating room. So if you, the radiologist, say that there's a subperiosteal abscess, as is seen here, in nine times out of 10, 
this is a surgical emergency. And I always have to tease my wife, and I said, you can't do anything without us. You just see that kid with the inflammation, but remember, we're the ones that make the difference, right? Then she usually walks away mad. That's okay. So, and I have to come here tonight to get a dinner. Otherwise, uh, there's no dinner for me at home. So, so this is just another example of subperiosteal abscesses. And it's, it's always amazing. These kids always present at night. They may be sick for a couple of days, but for some reason, they always present at night. I did my internship in the emergency room, and it never ceased to amaze me how someone could have back pain for three days, but for some reason, they would walk in at 1 o'clock in the morning with their back pain. I never could figure that one out. So when, in the middle of the night, when you see, does that happen to anybody else or is it just me? Is it just, <clears throat> yeah. So here's an example of another subperiosteal abscess. And the take home message that I'd like you to take from this slide is that you can have the lamina propria be completely intact. So if you're unsure about this and you say, hey, is that a real subperiosteal abscess? And you say, no, no, it can't be because the bone's intact and it's symmetrical to that seen on the opposite side. The, the question, the issue is, is absolutely it can be, because there are these little bridging emissary veins that cross the lamina propria. And these little emissary veins can develop a little septic thrombophobitis, and all the bugs on one side can be transmitted to the opposite side. So you can have a subperiosteal abscess with the bone completely being intact. The fourth step in the progression, so we talked about preceptal, we talked about postceptal, we talked about subperiosteal abscess, the fourth step is a patient with this, and this is, if you will, the three eye sign. There's one eye here, there's another eye here. You shouldn't have three eyes, I don't think, unless you're from Ohio State. That is, it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. Is anybody from Ohio State, from Columbus? Hopefully no one webcasting from Ohio State, right? So anyway, so here's a little inter, here's an intraorbital abscess here. So on the T1 post scatling with fat suppression, we can see this diffuse enhancement extending behind the orbit. So this is a, obviously a true surgical emergency. And here's an example. When I was at UNC before I got here, most of my stories are true most of the time. Can you get some more drinks out here? You guys are not. And I know my jokes are really good. So uh, <laughs> why are you laughing? OK, so, so this patient walked into the emergency room here, and, and I remember it was a Friday afternoon. Everything bad happens Friday afternoon, and I looked at this case, and I said, something's not right here. Here's a globe here, and this is normal or abnormal? Abnormal, right? There's air. And this patient actually had a frank intraorbital abscess, and what he had was an old blowout fracture that was never fixed. He developed all this mucosal thickening, and this developed into a frank intraorbital abscess that extended superiorly. So again, another example of an intraorbital abscess. So again, preceptal, postceptal, subperiosteal abscess, intraorbital abscess, and the fifth stage of the pro progression is this. Now, I show this, this has a lot of, in a way, a lot of meaning to me because when I first did my fellowship, you know, I went down to the University of Florida with Tony Mancuso, and you know, I, imagine me, I was an eager beaver resident, you know, hard to imagine that, right, David, hard to, hard to imagine. And I remember I wanted to go in academics, so I went to Tony and said, you know, I really want to write a paper. And I really want to, and one thing about writing papers is if you become an expert in that area, and this disease entity was the first disease entity I ever wrote about. It was six patients that Tony said, you know, write about this disease entity. And this is the final progression of periorbital infections. Now, does anybody know what disease entity we're looking at here and we're looking at here? That's exactly, what thrombosis? It's cavernous sinus thrombosis. And the reason why, if there's one thing to take home from my talk, is this right here. Because that six patients that I looked at with cavernous sinus thrombosis, five of those patients died. One of them had permanent neurological deficits. And the scary thing was each one of those had had cavernous sinus thrombosis seen on the initial imaging study, but it was missed. And the point is, is that this is a disease entity that you, the radiologist, that we, the radiologists, can make a difference. Because if we pick it up early, literally, we can save the patient's life. So this is cavernous sinus thrombosis. And this, was an, this is one example a few years ago. And this is you know, one of the ones I got lucky on. Again, it was Friday afternoon. It was the emergency room board. It was about 545. And this patient came into the, to the emergency room. And the history I got was rule out sinusitis. Right? And for some reason, they or ordered it with contrast. 
Now, we can make the diagnosis and we can say, you know what, there's a bunch of mucosal thickening here involving the ethmoid sinuses. We can, we can agree with that, right? But have you guys ever had the, have you ever had the feeling of impending doom when you've dictated a study? <laughs> have you ever dictated a study and are about to click sign and then you just get this queasy, nauseous feeling like you're missing something? Or am I the only one that's ever happened to? Right? I have. So I was about to hit this. I was about to hit the sign thing, and I said something's just not right. And so, what is it here that tells you that this is more than just regular periorbital infection? Yeah, what's all this stuff here, right? That's all infiltration of the retrobulbar fat. Normally, you should have nice, clean fat behind the globe, right? Well, when I looked at this, I said, you know, this doesn't sound right. So then I called up the emergency room. I said. Does this guy have any other symptoms besides sinusitis? Oh, yeah, he has a sixth nerve palsy. And I was like, thank you very much. So now he has a sixth nerve palsy. And now you're starting to see this structure right here, which is what? There's a little vein that runs in the orbit, and that's a superior ophthalmic vein. So now what we have is a patient with disease involving the ethmoid sinuses, infiltration of the retrobulbar fat, he has dilatation of the superior ophthalmic vein, and he has a sixth nerve palsy. So what we did is that we did this study right here, which is a CT venogram. So you do the CT venogram. Here is opacification of what? Here's opacification of the transverse sinuses, right? Now, when you look in this area right here, what should also be opacifying here? The cavernous sinus. And it's, it's not, is it, right? So there's no opacification of cavernous sinus. So this patient actually did have cavernous sinus thrombosis. So in this one, we got lucky. But, you know, it's always scary. You always wonder about all the cases you didn't get right. But if there's one take-home message for this, is remember the diagnosis of cavernous sinus and always have a very low suspicion. And if you ask me what's the study of choice for making the diagnosis, I still like CT venograms because they're very, very quick to do. This takes about 30 seconds to do. It's a very simple study. All the techs are now used to doing CTAs. If you just wait a little longer, you can do your CTV. So there's your cavernous sinus thrombosis. So you're in the middle of the night, and your patient comes in with an enlarging neck mass, right? So this is a patient that has an enlarging neck mass, and this is a patient that has a neck mass. Now, there is a subtle difference between this lesion and this lesion, and we can see some low attenuation here. Now, it would be pretty easy to call this an abscess, right? But the true diagnosis is that this is cervical adenitis and this is suppurative adenitis. And cervical adenitis, when I was growing up, this is what patients with mono had, right? You know, you get mono, you have some enlarged lymph nodes, you palpate it, and it hurts. That's cervical adenitis. And the suppurative adenitis are those same lymph nodes, but they have this area of low attenuation within the lymph nodes. So this is what the suppurative adenitis is. So it's not really a true abscess. And I'll show you an example of what a true abscess is. Now, here's an example of a case, path proven, that came in in the middle of the night. Again, a true story. And it was in a child and had enlargement of a cluster of lymph nodes, the neck, left neck, that were painful to palpation. So this is cervical adenitis. Now, does anybody want to venture a guess of what this child had? And he had a pet. It's cat scratch disease, exactly right. Now, most of the times we don't image cat scratch disease. But this is another example of cat scratch disease. So how do you, can you make the diagnosis in the middle of the night? A child comes in or adult comes in, clump group of lymph nodes that's painful to palpation. That's cervical adenitis. And one of the most common causes of cervical adenitis is cat scratch disease. Now, most of the times, again, David will probably say this as well, is cat scratch disease usually pre present with epitrochlear pain or lymph nodes, right? Is that right, Dave? Yeah, so, yeah okay. If, if I'm wrong, just tell me, right? So, so that's it. So, and the reason is that usually the kids, you know, they scratch their cat, they get, bit on the, uh, they get bit on the fingers, and the lymph node drainages to the elbow. But remember, sometimes your cat will lick you, or sometimes the cat will scratch you in the face. And that's why you get this drainage of the lymph nodes involved in the neck. <clears throat> this disease entity is one of those diseases, and, and when, when Dave and I were at the Brigham, we had Harry Mellons, who was our attending. And Harry would always make this comment. He would say, you only see what you look for, and you only diagnose what you know. And I always remember those words. And this is one of those disease entities that you could only make the diagnosis if you remember it. <clears throat> 
Now, if you were from India and someone showed you this, what's the most likely diagnosis because of the higher prevalence? TB. And what is the other name for TB? What do we call TB of the neck? This is scrofula. If you've ever seen, never seen scrofula, this is scrofula. So this is a clinical example of scrofula. And this is a patient, and this is where I, where I fell right off, the, you know, right off the wagon. This present, patient presented to our head and neck tumor board in North Carolina, and I thought he had a metastatic level 2 lymph node. And it turns out the patient was PPD positive, and the uh, pathology came back dysplastic squamous cells, and this was tuberculosis. So again, tuberculosis is one of those diseases that you have to think about before you make the diagnosis. And I'm sure in this disease entity, you can easily make the diagnosis. Here's a classical example of tu tuberculosis. Despite all this disease here in the spine, there's relative preservation of the angle. And this is what we sometimes describe as the cold abscesses associated with tuberculosis. And just a in just a second, I'm going to show you that these are not necessarily abscesses, but they're actually separative adenitis of special lymph nodes. <clears throat> this one's always fun, right? <clears throat> You're in the middle of the night, and now you've got a kid that comes in with a plain film, right? Don't you love that, right? Yeah. Normal or abnormal, right? Abnormal, right. We can see there's anterior displacement of the airway, so we have too much anterior soft tissue thickening. Well, if the patient's okay and you get a CT scan, now we start to see this disease entity here. Now, what is this disease entity? 20 years ago, 20 years ago, we used to call it an abscess. And I remember specifically patients going to the emergency room with an abscess. But what this really is, is enlargement. And what was the disease entity we said when patients had a lymph node that contained pus? Suppurative adenitis, right? So this is actually suppurative adenitis of a retropharyngeal lymph node. And again, you have to ask that question, so what? You know, why does it really matter that we say that this is suppurative adenitis and not an abscess? Because, again, harken back to my days as a fellow, is that 20 years ago, if we called this an abscess, the patients would go to the operating room. And they would get maybe about a cc of pus, not a lot. Now, we're all, you know, we're all radiologists in the audience, or we're, we're married to, to physicians, and, and, and it's fine. But remember the 99% of the people in the world that aren't physicians and that aren't radiologists, right? Can you imagine taking your child in the emergency room, and, and he's been doing good, he's got some pain, he's a little, he's, he's, now he's developing a fever, and a stranger comes to you and says, you know, unfortunately, your two-year-old son has a life-threatening infection, and we're going to have to take him to the operating room right away. And this is the type of discussion that we would be having in the middle of the night. But in actuality, this is inflammation and suppuration of a lymph node. And it's been well shown now that if we, the radiologists, properly say that this is suppurative adenitis of the retropharyngeal lymph node and the child has a stable airway, this can now be treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics and the surgery can be avoided. So that's why it makes a difference. Another example here, this is actually just edema involving the retropharyngeal space. So the retropharyngeal space, pure and simply, is very easy. So for the residents in the audience, what do you call the space behind the pharynx? Retropharyngeal. We're, we're the really smart residents. Who's studying for your boards? What do you call the parotid space? What do you call the space that contains a parotid gland? It's a parotid space, right? What do you call the space that contains a carotid artery? The, isn't head and neck easy? That's right. My intent is to have everybody in MRS be a head and neck radiologist over the next year. That's, that's my mission statement. So. so this is another example of suppurative adenitis. So this is true suppurative adenitis. And then you can ask the question, well, if this is suppurative adenitis, then what's a retropharyngeal space abscess? Well, if you don't treat the suppurative adenitis, this tends to blow up. And if you can imagine water balloons, if you think of the retropharyngeal lymph nodes as a water balloon, you continue adding water to it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then eventually what happens? It pops, right? It pops, and it pops into the retropharyngeal space. And then eventually, if it's not treated, it can erode anteriorly into the dens, in this case, in the dens, and eventually you end up having a frank retropharyngeal abscess here with, a, a, um, with an abscess involving the spinal canal. This is a true example of a retropharyngeal abscess. I don't think we'll ever confuse this with separative adenitis.
And this is another example of a retropharyngeal abscess. And this was a little two-year-old. You always hate this. He was playing with his sister. That's like the worst history in the world, right? The two-year-old is playing with his sister, walking around with a toothbrush in his mouth. The sister pushes him over, and the toothbrush pierces the pharyngeal wall. And unfortunately, the little guy came in with air. And here we can see fluid within the abscess. The child did fine, which was a good thing. But this, again, is another fairly typical example of retropharyngeal space abscess. Another example, this was a patient that had an NG tube placed, perforated the uh, piriform sinus. The patient developed an, an abscess. And here's the drainage of the abscess. Here we can see all this milky white substance. That's actually the pus coming out of the retropharyngeal space abscess. Another one more example here, another example of a retropharyngeal space abscess. And remember, the retropharyngeal space is the space behind the pharynx. But the retropharyngeal space extends all the way down into the mediastinum. And it ends between T2 and T6. So anytime that you are suspecting an infection involving the retropharyngeal space, make sure that you extend your imaging studies down into the upper mediastinum. Because in this case, this abscess extended all the way down into the chest area. So remember that conduit of spread. We have this space right here in purple, which is a retropharyngeal space. And for extra credit, anybody remember the name of this orange space that extends all the way down through the, into, through the diaphragm into the abdomen? Any remember that? Danger space, exactly right. That's the danger space. <clears throat> so when I put this talk together a few years ago, there was one disease entity that I never saw. And I would go to the meetings and people would say, yeah, this is this is this is this is this disease. And I would say, I never saw that disease. Never saw it before. And then I started putting the talk together. I said, have you seen any cases of this? And then I went back and read a couple of my reports. And it turns out I'd seen some of these cases. I didn't recognize it, but I had seen it. And this is one of these examples. This patient presented in the middle of the night presents with edema involving the retropharyngeal space. You do a, a CT scan, and now you do the bone algorithms. And does anybody know what this diagnosis is? What am I outlining right here? Bone, right? Ossification. This is what's referred to as calcific tendinitis. So it's hydroxyapatite. And the thing is, is that these patients present in the middle of the night. They'll present with neck pain. And you're looking for all these abscesses. You're looking for something that's life-threatening. And you may see a little bit of edema and you kind of blow it off. But actually, what you need to do is look at the bone algorithms and see if you see this little bone right here. And this is calcific tendinitis. And the satisfying thing is that if we, the radiologists, make the diagnosis of calcific tendinitis, the patients can be treated with anti-inflammatory drugs and they just go home. Just a little, little aspirin and they're fine. Another example here, edema involving the retropharyngeal space. Maybe there's something here. We go to the bone algorithms, and now we can see this calcification involving the longest coli tendons. So one thing I would say to my partners out in private practice, I'm sure you're doing neck CTs. I know you enjoy reading them. It's fantastic. But if you're not getting bone algorithms, start getting your bone algorithms, because I can assure you it's going to help you overall in, your in, in making accurate diagnosis. One more example here, retropharyngeal space edema. And again, another example of calcific tendinitis. And it's much more common than you think it is. And I can assure you, the only way you're going to make that diagnosis is if you look at the bone algorithms. So here's another example. Someone comes in, both these cases came in the middle of the night. And you say to yourself, normal or abnormal, right? Natasha was with me. So if you remember, I draw a line down the middle, compare one side to the other, right? Remember those days, right? Draw it, and I still do it. I still do it every day in our PAC system. And there's obviously an abnormality involving the right neck, right? So now the issue is, is what would you call this disease entity? Let's just say it's an abscess, and it is an abscess. So what would you call this disease entity? How many would say it's a peritonsal abscess, right? Okay, peritonsal abscess is what we default to. But in actuality, this is an abscess involving the tonsil, and this is an abscess involving a space. Now, what space is this triangular space here that's next to the pharynx? What do you call the space next to the pharynx? That's the peripharyngeal space. So on your left, this is a patient that has a tonsillar abscess. And on your right, it's a patient that has a peripharyngeal space abscess. So again, you ask that question, so what? 
why does it make a difference? And the reason is, is that if you say that this is a tonsor abscess, the surgeon can go in and drain this intraorally, and the patient does not have to go to the operating room. But in the exam on your right, if you say that it's a parapharyngeal space abscess, this patient goes to the operating room the next day, has a cervical approach, and it's drained. And you can ask me, well, how are you so confident? I'm just a dumb radiologist. How do you know about this? And the reason I know is that the patient on your right many years ago at my old institution was actually called a tonsor abscess. So they tried to drain this several times intraorally. They didn't get any pus, but they were pretty sure there was an abscess. The next day, we said it was in the peripharyngeal space. That patient immediately went to the operating room. So yes, even though there's only about five or six millimeters from here to here, Know how that little nuance makes a big difference in how that patient was initially treated. This disease entity we all know. This is an example of an abscess involving the sublingual space. And again, here is an example here of an abscess involving the sublingual space. And we can make the diagnosis it's a subperiosteal abscess. But when we look at the bone algorithms, we can say that there's a rotten tooth. Now, granted, if this is referred to you by a dentist or an ENT surgeon or an ER physician, you know, most of the times they already know that this type of abscess is caused by a rotten tooth. But sometimes it's referred to us by people that may not have in that degree of knowledge. So it's really us as the radiologists that are going to say there's a subperiosteal abscess. Look at your bone algorithms and re redirect them to the area that needs the inciting feature of that abscess itself. And this is an old example, or excuse me, this is an example of Ludwig's angina. And Ludwig's angina is essentially a sublingual space abscess on steroids. And one of the reasons it was called Ludwig's angina is the following. Notice how there are multiple loculations here of fluid within the sublingual space. But look back here and take a look at what also is very inflamed and edematous. And that is what? This is the epiglottis. So one of the ways that, in theory, if you read back, Ludwig's angina was actually neck pain and chest pain that resulted from this sublingual space abscess, a compartment, a compartment syndrome, if you will. Here's another example of Ludwig's angina, multiple abscesses involved in the sublingual space. And just from a normal anatomy standpoint, here's the hyoid bone here. The epiglottis is an anterior midline structure. Here's the area epiglottic fold. Here's the piriform sinus. And here we can have this a diffuse edema involving the left area epiglottic fold. So again, this patient's with Ludwig's angina, the disease extended backwards to give you edema involved in the area epiglottic fold. And how do you treat this? Well, the surgeon makes a little incision here below the neck, and they literally go in there and they start resecting all the septations because this is a compartment syndrome. It's a multi-compartmented, walled off, septated abscess, and literally what they have to do is go in there and try to eliminate and lyse all those septa. Now, this is a disease entity that you can make the diagnosis, again, in the middle of the night. And the answer to this is the following. How do you make the diagnosis? First of all, normal or abnormal, right? Abnormal, right? What's the abnormality that we see here? Besides all the edema, because we can see edema after a lot of disease entities, but what's the finding here that tips you off that this is just more than a regular, a regular infection? It's an air, right? If I told you that this patient presented with high fever, neck pain, but had never had surgery and has never been treated with radiation therapy or chemotherapy, this is a specific diagnosis. Anybody want to take a guess? Have you ever heard of necrotizing fasciitis? You have, right? Because when the New York Times talks about necrotizing fasciitis, they don't call it necrotizing fasciitis, right? What do they call necrotizing fasciitis? Flesh-eating bacteria. This is the flesh-eating bacteria. And you can make a diagnosis on this because if you see air in the soft tissues and the patient's never had surgery and they've never had radiation therapy or chemotherapy, this is necrotizing fasciitis. And just to contrast this, this was a patient that had chemotherapy and radiation therapy, had air just outside of the thyroid cartilage, 
And this is just laryngeal or chondronecrosis. So you can get air and chondronecrosis, but again, just to reiterate, the key to making this diagnosis is no history of prior treatment. Well, let's talk a little bit towards the end now about vascular emergencies. And I think well, you, we sort of remember the good old days. I don't know if they were good anymore. I remember when I was a resident, and I guess Dave can relate to this, we were on angio call, and all of a sudden we'd get called in the middle of the night for a gunshot wound, right? He called them, and this was long before the days of CTA. And the issue was is that if it involved zone number three or zone number one, and it was felt that the bullet was sort of in that trajectory, we would have to do an angio because for zone two injuries, they could potentially explore it. But on the other hand, zone three and zone one, they couldn't. So what we would end up doing is that we would end up doing angiography. And what we would end up looking for is to see whether or not there were things like this, which is a dissection and a pseudoaneurysm. So here's an example. Again, what's that worst history you could have when, when, you've got a, when you've got a young boy, right? Playing with his sister, right? So they were playing together, right? Johnny was playing with Jill. And they got a little bit, you know, you know how things, things didn't go well after a while, right? So they were playing with a pencil and all of a sudden, mom heard Johnny goes ouch and starts crying. Well, you did a plain film, normal or abnormal, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, there's a CT scan, right? Abnormal, and there's a little pencil. Here's the eraser. There's the pencil coming out, and there's the pencil being put back together again. Luckily, the child did fine, so I feel very comfortable showing this. So the kid did fine. But the child did end up having an angiogram, and we can see this dissection here involved in the internal carotid artery. So this was an older slide. It was a few years ago, about 15 years ago. But now this has been replaced by a variety of cross-sectional studies. So just by a show of hands in the audience, if someone comes in with a potential carotid dissection, how many people still do angiograms as a first line? Pretty much nobody, right? How many people are doing CTAs? And how many people are doing MRAs? That's interesting. So that's about, about a third to two thirds. So if either one is fine, in fact, we have this internal debate in our own di division. I like to do CTAs first and foremost, but there are other people, very experienced people in our division that like to do MRAs. And the primary reason to do an MRA is to see if whether or not the patient has an infarct. And clearly, you know, with diffusion imaging, that's something that CT cannot really com compete with. So if you are doing MR for dissections, it's always good to remember the characteristic appearance of a dissection. So those of you guys that are going to Louisville in your near future, this is pretty much fair game for the boards. Here we have a classical example of a carotid dissection. We see the narrowed lumen compared to the opposite side, and we can see this eccentric area of T1 shortening, both on T1 and on T2. So anybody for the residents in the audience, what blood product is this? If it's high signal on T1 and high signal on T2. MET, methemoglobin, right? So there's your methemoglobin. High signal on T1, high signal on T2, and it's extracellular methemoglobin. This is the MRA, normal on the right side, and here we can see the cutoff on the left side. So again, a pretty typical example of a dissection. Well, one thing that I want to point out to you, if you are doing MRs for carotid dissections, is that here's a pretty typical example of a vertebral artery dissection compared to the opposite side. Notice the normal caliber of the vertebral artery. Now, on the opposite side, notice the eccentric area of brightness and notice how the caliber of the vertebral artery is smaller. Another example here, here's complete occlusion of the vertebral artery. Another example here, there's our MRA. But notice in this particular case, this was a patient that had what have we done to this case? It's a T1 weighted image, but what did we do to the T1 weighted image that I haven't shown before? What, what did we end up doing here? The fat suppression, right? So you end up doing fat suppression. And if you end up doing fat suppression, what's this? Is that a dissection or what? Well, be really careful. Remember, the, the large vessels, the carotids and the vertebral arteries, the wall has to have some type of nutrients to live. And the way it gets their nutrients is actually by blood supply to that wall. What was that? Sorry about that. With blood is that me? I don't know what that is. Oh well. Throw it away. 
Um, so, I've been wanting to do that for years. <laughs> so here's here we have here. We can see there's some T1 shortening here. And what this is is actually fat suppression artifact involving the vertebral artery. So if you are doing MR for dissections and you are doing fat suppression, realize that you can end up getting a fat suppression artifact in the walls. And I remember this case distinctly. I just moved to Ann Arbor. It was that first weekend of a sunny summer afternoon, and I thought to myself, I'm just going to enjoy this Sunday off. And then I got called in this case, and I looked at this, and I said, it's fat suppression artifact. But you know, once the ire of a dissection is raised, you can't do anything about it. You have to come and do the angiogram. And just this was just the corroborative, corroborative MRA that we ended up doing. And you can see that there's no evidence of dissection. Also be aware of the pseudo-dissection artifacts. So if you are using 3T, and if you only have a head coil, be, again, be careful about the pseudo-dissection artifacts. So this was a patient that was done in a 1.5 Tesla unit. This is the exact same patient that was done on three Tesla. Notice the vertebral artery here and the vertebral artery here. And at 1.5 Tesla, or three Tesla, all of a sudden we're seeing bright signal. And the issue is, is this, did this patient develop bilateral vertebral artery dissections or is it artifact? And my point is that if it's just a head coil only, you can have this flow-related enhancement. Now, if you do everything with a combined head and neck coil, this artifact tends to vanish. One more example here on a 1.5 Tesla unit. Here we have the normal carotid artery here on one side. We repeated a three Tesla, and now it looks like the patient's occluded his carotid artery, right? It looks like it's completely occluded. All that is, again, is just artifact. It's just artifact. And again, you can eliminate that if you use the combined coil. This, on the other hand, is a true dissection. And if you ever get in a pinch, one thing that we have found is that if you do diffusion imaging, if you look at the ADC maps, the ADC tends to have lower signal in true thrombus as opposed to um, just looking at the vessel itself. So if you're not clear, look at that ADC map. And if you're unclear of what this is here, you can make that diagnosis by looking at the ADC value. So again, we found it pretty helpful. I think we all do CTAs. I think two thirds of the audience is doing CTAs for dissection. You know, I don't want to say too much. I showed that one case early about the kid that had the, the you know, the pencil in his neck. This was a, a case, uh, you know, one of my ENT colleagues called me at five in the morning. It was Tuesday morning and he called me and said his little niece underwent a elective dental procedure. And she's a concert pianist, a concert level pianist, and all of a sudden she couldn't move the right part of her body. And unfortunately what happened is that when they were doing this maxillary pull, they ended up having a little dissection here involving the carotid artery. And here we can see the little, little dissection here. Fortunately, she's doing extremely well right now. In fact, she just had a recital about, a year, uh, about six months ago, so we're all happy to hear that. But again, just to reiterate the, the benefits of CTA, we avoided doing the angiogram in this patient, and she was able to be followed completely with just CTA alone. This is an example of a little vertebral artery dissection just done by a little angio, a very, very easy angio to do. Nothing pr happened at all. The patient just complained just of a little bit of pain during the procedure and unfortunately had a little dissection. And we followed this patient non-invasively again by performing CT angiography. Again, a very, very robust way. Now, all of you in the audience know that CTA is great. I mean, we all use it. We can use it for all parts of the body. And like that first slide I showed when we showed the zone injury, zone one, two, and three, we have seen a transition from angiography to CTA to MRA. And the majority of the literature says that it's really, really a great study. But there was an article that came out in the AJR back in three years ago that really gave us pause. And something didn't make sense because the specificity was good, but the sensitivity was only 64%. And I looked at that article and I said, how can this be so discordant with the remaining of the literature? And this, I'll tell you right now, this was done on a single detector study. So, you know, I tend not to, to worry about that one too much. But this was on a multi-detector study and they looked at 331 patients. And I said, how can it be that big a discrepancy? Well, this is the caution in the wind. This was a patient that came in and Dheeraj Gandhi gave me this when he was still here that came in and, and had a gunshot wound, obviously. We can see, she showed the streak artifact. Actually, this is not streak artifact. This was actually from the dental amalgam. This was all going over the carotid. So how many times 
have you looked at a CTA and you look at the reformats and everything looks great except for this one area, which is streak artifact from the dental amalgam. You say, ah, that's all right. I'll just close my eyes. I won't look at it. Anybody ever done that or is it just me again, right? Never happens to us in the middle of the night, right? Never. Well, guess what? The patient went for an angio and there's the dissection. So when you read that paper, this is what they were saying is that you have to be very, very cautious about these streak artifacts. And unless you can visualize that whole area of the carotid artery, just be very, very cautious. You're just saying, you know what, I'm going to blow it off. It's completely normal. So the last case I'll show is this. Now, I'm a head and neck guy, right? So I cannot show, give a lecture without talking about, you know, head and neck cancer, right? Because I love head and neck cancer. So this patient came in, and we're going to spend the next two hours going over all of these post-treatment changes, right? No, we're not. So obviously, this patient's had a variety of complex areas. He had chemotherapy, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, bilateral neck dissections. He had a total laryngectomy. He had a pull through. And all of a sudden, he came in bleeding. And we did a CTA. And now, you don't see this very often. But here's the carotid artery on one side. Here's the carotid artery on the opposite side. And does anybody want to take a guess? as to what that is. That's, that's right, that's a frank extravasation. So if you ever see this on a CT angio, if you ever have a patient comes in with a head and neck cancer and they have a little bleeding, because remember, this is what's referred to as a sentinel hemorrhage, a sentinel bleed. And if you ever see this on a CTA, this is the typical appearance of acute extravasation on a CT angio. If you see this right away, call the ER, call your interventional radiologist and say this patient is having acute extravasation and that's the reason that they're bleeding. Because sometimes they just bleed because, you know, the treatment side gets a little rough and gets a little edgy. But this is acute extravasation and, you know, please don't, don't forget that. So in summary, what I've tried to do over the last 40 minutes or so is talk a little bit about neck infections and vascular emergencies. And the one take-home message that I'll give you is don't forget about cavernous sinus thrombosis because I can tell you right now, every one of you in this room is going to see it. And if you can pick it up in the first time, you're going to make a huge difference in how these patients are treated. So I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank Rojan for the honor of being here. And thank you very much for coming.